Yes. Um, Thanks. You. Thanks, Nacho. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Um, is this, this is just for that, right? You guys can hear me, right? The acoustics are pretty good in here. Cool. Um, so I, w I thought I'd take a minute, probably all of you are familiar with, with, more familiar with U.S. geography than I am with Spanish geography, but I thought I'd take a minute to, to orient you. So um, I'm, I'm working at a university here on the central coast of California. This is the San Francisco Bay Area here, and then, then we're south of that, and this is the Los Angeles, Santa Monica Bay here. So we're halfway in between the state, and right behind us is uh, the San Joaquin Valley, and about 13% of the food that's produced in the United States comes from this one little valley here. Well, it's not little, but it's, it's um, if you drive through it, it doesn't look little. Um, and so uh, there's a lot also in this area right behind our campus is the Salinas Valley. There's a lot of agricultural production there. So there's a lot of um, thought that goes into sustainable ag production. Um, and that in, in, in some sense um, is one reason among many why I moved from Washington to, to California. I'm very interested in the applied aspects of the research that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and we are, um, uh, just as you guys have a very interesting the World Expo kind of reuse of, of this part of the city, we are on an old army base that was repurposed by President Clinton about 20 years ago and turned into a university. And so it's a really neat place to be, to see these old buildings that was, a, was an army base now turned into an educational center. Um, and so we're right here on the, the, the Monterey Bay. We're part of a, a 23 campus system of the California State University, which is also a very interesting place to be because we have um, this enormous, almost 500,000 students across the entire state. Um, and you can see, I've circled ours here, but these are, these are all campuses of the California State University. And so we have um, a lot of collaboration amongst the, the, the campuses in the north and the south. Um, it's much like if you're familiar with the University of California system, um, we have twice as many campuses. So. Um, so I have, um, over, the, over the last several decades, been interested in various um, applications of um, what, I, what I'm trying to distill down here to, to a simple set of questions. And basically, I'm interested in what, what factors regulate um, populations uh, of species that are either economically important or perhaps they're endangered. We're trying to conserve them. Um, or if they're economically important, maybe we're trying to kill them, right, in terms of biocontrol or pest control. Uh, and, I have done a lot of field work looking at um, the effects of habitat heterogeneity on biocontrol and on um, herbivore populations and trying to integrate the two sides of the coin of agricultural production and, and um, conservation science. I'm going to talk more today about an, uh, some more interests that I developed after a little bit later, but I've been working in this for a while, and that's in the field of ecotoxicology and the effects of pesticides and other toxicants on populations. Um, and as Nacho said in his introduction, I've got, I'm a reformed mathematician. I started in mathematics and decided that wasn't for me. I wanted to be more applied, but as a result, the legacy of that is I'm able to talk with mathematicians, and so I do a lot of collaboration still. So even though I'm not really an active, I don't think of myself as an active mathematician, I do like to talk to mathematicians, and I do like to think about mathematical models as a way to interpret or solve questions that we have in, um, in ecology. Um, and I've, um, I've got some pictures here, just, um, I won't have time to talk about it today, but I've been working in Kenya for about five years, in East Africa, and I've been doing work in Costa Rica for about 15 years, and those are, those are um, slightly different projects. Um, I got interested in this ecotoxicology stuff um, back in the early, the er well, mid-90s. Um, the United States Congress passed a law that, that basically mandated a review of all the pesticides that were used on food crops. And this was actually aimed at protecting children. Um, it's the kind of thing that we might not see today in the current administration in the U.S., but back then, they, they were very much interested in protecting children and, uh, from food uh, pesticide residues, right? So, so what happened was all of, these, um, all of these pesticide uses were closely examined, and a bunch of them were declared illegal. And so as a result, we lost a lot of the pesticides that farmers use to control pests. It created an opportunity to study the effects of pesticides because a whole bunch of new pesticides, and you all are familiar with neonicotinoids, for instance, a whole bunch of new pesticides were coming on the scene at that time. And so um, I started off in this area doing field work with neonicotinoids like imidacloprid, which were experimental at that time. Um, and that now, of course, we know much more about them, but at that time we did not. So, um, that motivated 
some of the questions that, that, that I had early on, basically um, questions like how, how do species uh, respond? How do populations in particular respond when they're exposed to pesticides? And again, either endangered species or species that are economically important for food production. Um, and the way that we normally answer that question, the way that um, has been the gold standard for a long time, is we, we do a, a dose response curve. And you're probably familiar with this, you've probably seen this in textbooks. So the idea is you take an animal, you put it in a petri dish, you dose it with a pesticide, and then you look and see what percentage of the animals in the petri dish are dead, right? And then you dose it a little bit more, and you keep doing that until you get 50% of the population dying. And we, that's the, the, an index that's been developed called the LD, lethal dose, or the LC, lethal concentration, um, 50. Does that make sense? And you guys familiar with that? Um, and this is widely used. Uh, it gives us, a, it gives us a, an index, right? A way to, to tie toxicants to uh, population outcomes. But it's, it's, um, it's very useful because you can rank the toxicity of different things, right? And if you look at this, here's a, here's a list of typical LD50s. Um, and if you look here, of course, you see aspirin and table salt, right? These, these have very high LC50s and things like ricin and botulism toxins, they have very low ones, right? Um, and, and as they say in, eco in toxicology, the dose makes the poison, right? So it's just a matter of how much before it becomes um, super toxic. There are a lot of problems with this approach, of course. Um, it doesn't say anything to us about the population growth, because it's a snapshot, right? It's just a, a very quick picture of what's happening with, these, with, with the, the, toxin, the toxicants. It doesn't actually account for any of the details of population age structure. So if you have a, an age structure or a stage structure, depending on what organism you're talking about, that's skewed one way or the other, um, the outcomes could be very different. But this, this ignores all that because you're just taking a snapshot, right? Um, it doesn't consider any other differences in life history parameters, and that's going to be my focus in today's talk. It doesn't consider sublethal or delayed effects at all because it's just, again, a snapshot static um, picture. Um, and for the last 20 years, there's been a whole bunch of work, um, including some of the stuff that we've done in what we did in Washington and stuff that's been done in, um, in Europe and the UK, trying to figure out better ways of doing this. And yet it persists. And in, um, I and my colleagues have given lots of talks to, to folks like the, at the Environmental Protection Agency who say, we're not going to change this. It's just, it's just how it's done. So, so we've been trying to move the needle a little bit on that. Um, and we think that, that we've come up with a better approach. And this better approach has to do with matrix models. So this is linear algebra. It's very simple mathematics, it's, um, which is why I like it, right? Because it's, it's very intuitive. I think it's very intuitive. Um, and it doesn't require a whole bunch of, you don't need to understand a whole bunch of theorems. You have to understand basically one, one theorem or one result from a theorem. Um, and the idea here is that we can take life history data and plug it directly into an organized matrix like this. And know, if we know something about the starting population, we can project what the population is going to do over time. Okay? It is very simplistic also, so it's a very simple model. It doesn't account for all kinds of things, and I could say more about that in a little bit, but it's a nice starting place to take real data that we, that we earn in the lab or in the field, plop it into a model, and try to figure out what's happening long term. Um, and the kinds of data that we need for this kind of a model are fecundity rates that are based on each stage or age of the organism, and growth rates, or survival rates, I should say, from one stage to the next, right? So, and again, I think many of you are probably, I don't know your backgrounds, we don't have time to, I wish I had time to find out, but many of you are probably familiar with this approach and maybe, maybe use it, I don't know. Is anybody here using this kind of stuff? In there, okay, so, so this isn't too redundant. So, so, um, so if, we, if we organize it in this matrix like this, with the fecundities across the top and on the sub-diagonal, the survivorships or survival rates from one stage to the next, um, and then we take a vector that tells you how many organisms are in each stage, each life stage here, and we multiply this matrix, it's called a transition matrix in linear algebra speak, times this vector, it gives us a projection for the next time step of what the population is going to look like. How many individuals will be in each of these age or stage structures 
uh, these bins, all right? If we do that again, take this thing and multiply it by this same transition matrix, and again and again, eventually, it's like, um, and oh, here's another piece that's, miss, <laughs> that's missing. There's supposed to be a big lambda here, all right? So just imagine a lambda. It's the Mac, it's the Mac um, Windows interface problem here. Um, eventually, if you keep multiplying this, this matrix, which I denote by A here, times this vector, it's like multiplying this vector by a constant, which is known typically as lambda um, in, in linear algebra and also in conservation science and other areas where this is used. And so lambda basically is a scalar. It's basically you're taking each of these and multiplying it by 3.2 or 0.7 or whatever, and, and it doesn't change eventually. So that's the mathematical result, that eventually if you continue to multiply this matrix times the, the, the next time steps population, eventually it hits an equilibrium point and you, you're just multiplying by a scalar. Does that make sense? So you're not doing matrix algebra anymore. So it can give you a growth rate for the population, and if the growth rate is bigger than one, the population's growing, and if it's less than one, it's not growing, right? So it's a real simple, um, uh, way to, to, to assess what's happening in the population. These are the kinds of data that you need um, when you're using these kinds of models, and basically it's life table data. So you, you need to rear organisms, you need to get their survival rate from one time step to the next, you need to get their reproductive output from each time, from each age or stage structure, um, and it's the kind of thing that's very intensive in a laboratory setting, but it can be done uh, pretty easily, all right, with, with um, with some replication. So we started playing around with this approach um, over 10 years ago and just trying to do simple models to explore issues in biocontrol and sustainable um, IPM. And so one of the first things that we did uh, was look at uh, a simulation where we had a population of 100,000 of three different species, aphids, a parasitoid, D. rapey, which we'll talk about more in a minute, and uh, the C7 ladybird beetle, which was imported in the US from Europe in around the early 1980s and is everywhere now, all spread across the western United States. And if we use this approach and, and simulate a 50% reduction, which corresponds to that LD50, so half the population is killed, and then we look at how long it takes for that, so this was the original population here, and then we, we cut it in half and then look and see how long it takes to get up to that same level and we can measure the delay in recovery, basically, for these three species, each of which gets hit by this 50% reduction. And the delay for this, this aphid is eight days, the delay for the parasitoid is 15 days, and the delay for the, the C7, after it gets hit, to come back to the pre-LD50 level was 31 days. So we were able to, to, to sort of play around with this and see that in terms of biocontrol, we're, re, we're decoupling, we're decoupling the predator from the prey, even though they're all just getting hit with 50% reductions. All right, so we, we started um, using the, this, these kinds of models with actual data from the laboratory to project what might happen out in the field, right? So there's obviously some, simplis simplistic, um, some simplifying going on there. Um, so today I want to talk to you about um, the idea of surrogate species. And surrogate species um, are a very real concept in, in legal terms in the United States and elsewhere because there are species that are, we cannot touch, we cannot harass, we cannot harm, um, but people want to know something about their biology and they want to know something about how to protect them in conservation science. Um, this is a simple example from, from Hawaii of a sign that actually has almost the, the legal language on the sign saying, do not mess with the Hawaiian monk seals. If you've been to Hawaii, these, these guys are lying around usually on the sand and they're very easy to harass. So that's, they have to put all these signs up and usually a rope around them because they are, they are, heavily, they are highly protected and you're not allowed to do anything to them. Um, the upshot of this is that because of the Endangered Species uh, Act, that we need to find another way to understand the biology, something about the biology of these organisms. And so what typically happens is we use a stand-in, a surrogate. Um, and the use of surrogate species then is a way to, to experiment, to, to find something that's very similar, um, and then try to project what would happen to the protected species 
uh, if we were uh, to subject it to toxicants, right? So that's the basic idea of the surrogate species approach. Um, in the United States, and things are a little bit different in the EU, but in the United States, um, we, we have a, a series of set surrogates that are, that are prescribed. So if you're interested in, for instance, sal uh, salmonids protecting salmon, there are a, a handful of fish that you can use to experiment that have been determined to be very similar. Similar enough that if you do experiments on those and look at the results, that you can, you can infer something about what's happening with the salmonids. And, I'll, and that's actually where we first started, and I'll say something about that uh, first. Um, and then the next example I'll give um, sort of lays bare the idea in the United States that if, we want, if you want to register a new pesticide, you need to look and see what the effect is on the European or imported honeybee, and that's it. So that bee is a stand-in or a surrogate, right? Apis is a surrogate for all arthropods. Now, I think in the U, it's like five. It's like you've got different, different orders of arthropods that have to be tested, so it's a little bit more complex, and, and we're hoping to move in that direction. Um, it still would be a sim, uh, simpl uh, simplification, but, but for us, it's just this one organism, and you have to show the effects on it, and that's good for everything, for, for odonates, for, for all hymenoptera. Um, and again, that's, this was an inspiration for us to sort of look at this idea of surrogate species using a life history approach. All right, but this is a screenshot from the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Um, so it says here that if you want to look at fish, you're interested in protecting fish, um, basically, you've got the choice of these three fishes here, and it's actually basically just plug in numbers here, and, and you can use the results of these three fishes to protect all of the salmon or whatever fish that you're trying to preserve. So it's, it's, it's like a prepackaged deal that they've got where you can just plug in uh, these drop down menus. It's, um, it's quite remarkable. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is, is also very much um, focused on identifying um, ecosystem services potentially affected by pesticides. That was one of the tenets of this um, back when this was published um, 15, 14 years ago. Um, and so again, looking at the potential effects of pesticides on e ecosystem services is, is sort of, that's the confluence of what we were, we we're going for here. Um, when, when people are trying to figure out what would be an appropriate surrogate for an, an, an organism. Often they reach to things that we would probably all in this room think would be reasonable. The physiology might be similar between the species we're trying to protect and the one that we're trying to find a surrogate for, or they might have some evolutionary relationship that's similar, and so we think, okay, they might have a, they might have a similar response to toxicants, um, or they might have other ecological similarities. And then there's often a, a safety factor that's used when they're prescribing limits of acceptable pesticides or toxicants, right? There's, a, there's like a hazard quotient that's, that's calculated, and there's often a safety factor of like, okay, we think it can tolerate this much, so we'll set the limits for the environmental um, use of these pesticides to one-tenth of that, or one one-hundredth. But I think um, all along I thought we could do better than that. That's kind of, that, right, that's a, a safety or a fudge factor. We can do better than that um, because we're smarter than that. So we think, I think that there's, there's more reliable ways of um, making these predictions, especially if we can pay more attention to the life history of these organisms. Um, so the work I'm gonna talk about now is, has been done in collaboration over this, the last decade or two with um, several colleagues, John Stark at uh, Washington State University, um, Roger Vargas in, uh, in Hawaii at the USDA, um, who actually just passed away uh, this summer, um, sadly. Um, uh, Azmi Akla, who's a mathematician at, in Louisiana, and his postdoc, um, Amy Vaprauskas, who's also a mathematician. And so we're, um, we're using a combination of field data and lab data from Roger and John, uh, and then um, trying to use these modeling approaches to to incorporate them into these models like I was talking about. So this is the, the matrix I was showing you before, and this is the actual matrix that we started to, to develop. And the first thing that we applied this to was a salmon project. We were interested in seeing if we could look at, at predicting what happens to, a, to a, an endangered salmon species by looking at other fish, right, like I mentioned before. So um, for this iteration, we used a four-stage structure. This is based on some published research already in the Washington, Seattle, Washington area where I was um, based when, when, we, when we did this work. And all we needed to do was look at a couple of fecundity rates 
for um, the third and fourth stages, and we looked at survivorship for all four, from stage one to stage two, stage two, stage three, stage three to stage four, and so forth. Um, so these A's here are survivorship, and these F's are fecundity, and this is the starting population. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about the mathematics too much, but if we look at um, if we if we look at deconstructing these matrices, and then we find the largest eigenvalue, it turns out to be this rather um, unwieldy expression here, and then from that we can generate um, something that's like a lambda, basically a, 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 a threshold number that tells us um, if we're below that, if this number is below one, then the population is crashing. If this number is above one, the population is going up. All right, and this R naught is this is the index that we're looking at. If you look at this this thing here, this the R naught is basically the reproductive output of the population. It's taking um, the birth rate of stage three times um, all the individuals that survive from stage one to stage two and stage two to stage three. And it's adding that to the birth rate at stage four times all the individuals that survive to stage four. And then it multiplies this through. Um, and so it actually is fairly intuitive when you, when you break it out into what, this is what a Taylor series expansion from, if you remember from calculus. So um, it's fairly intuitive and it gives us a number to work with when we look at the population. So what we did was we said, let's simulate a toxin Let's simulate a pesticide, say, that's going to knock down this population. And so we can take this um, fecundity rate, so we're just looking at sublethal effects right now, effects on the reproductive output, all right, not survivorship. So we said let's take the fecundity rate and let's, let's multiply it by something less than one, and that's this one minus delta for each of the life stages, and we'll call that the, the toxic, the, the toxic um, fecundity rate. All right, so this is the, the reproductive rate with the toxin. Does that make sense? Um, and this is the old one without the toxin. And so we can make, um, we can redo the equation I had in the last page, but, but now it's the, it's the population growth with the toxin. And it looks just like the last expression, except that it's got this one minus delta in it instead of, instead of um, this times one. All right, everybody with me there? And so you can look then, you can say, okay, let's, let's run this, this, um, this matrix model for the population with the regular fecundity and for the, the model with this toxin-laden fecundity, all right? So we can do this an experiment. We can also change this, right? We can say, well, let's knock it down 5%, let's knock it down 10%, let's knock it down 20%. You can see what happens to the population if you do that, all right, with this R0. You can see if the population continues to rise or continues. In fact, you can actually calculate where it blinks out, where it actually starts to go extinct, where it goes from above one to below one. All right, so that so we can look at a survive a, a threshold for the population. Um, so um, what I want to point out here, rather than dwell on this, is that what we really want to avoid is if we're using a surrogate species. We really want to avoid a situation where we say, oh, the surrogate's doing fine, it's doing fine, so our, our protect, the species we're trying to protect, it's okay, and it's not. That we're, we're misinformed, we're misled by what I call here a type two error, right? So we have a false negative. So it's basically, oh, there's no problem, there's no problem, but there actually is a problem, and the surrogate would be dying out um, even though the, I mean, sorry, the, the protected species would be dying out even though the surrogate is doing fine, right? So that's worse than the other way around, a type one error, which would be that the surrogate species dies out very quickly, but the, the protected species, the one we're trying to protect, doesn't die, right? Does everybody see that? So we, don't, we really don't want to be in this situation here. Um, so we, have, we can calculate a threshold um, and then we applied this to, to salmonid data. And like I said, I was in Washington for 16 years and salmon is a big deal there. Um, the, the, salmon run, the salmon runs are a big part of the economy, they're a big part of the culture, the identity in the northwestern part of the United States. So we had published data from one of the local fisheries research um, uh, institutes and they had data on Chinook and coho salmon um, and then they were representing this with four different species of surrogates. So all these other fish, a bass, a fathead minnow, a cutthroat trout, and a round goby. And you'll notice, by the way, that the, the, uh, the Oncoronchus genus, um, is, that's the salmon 
genus. Um, the cutthroat trout is in the same genus. And I point that out because we're going to look and see how well they, even these closely related species, predict the fate of each other. So we used data that had been published already with four life stages. You can do all the calculations here. These are from the actual published literature that was done experimentally. Um, and then we could look and see where is it that this R0, this threshold, this lambda, goes between one, you know, below one, or sorry, sorry, above one to below one, right? So here are the Salmonids. These are the ones we're trying to protect. These are, this is the endangered species, right? So it's somewhere around 14, 13% um, de decrease in the fecundity. Remember, we're, we're doing a sublethal effect here. So if that delta is at 0.13, um, it switches over and the population crashes. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what happens for the Salmonids. If we look at the round goby, it persists all the way up to almost like 18%. So these are, the, these are the surrogates, right, that are commonly used. And you saw that, that EPA screenshot, right? These are the, these are the fish that are, that are recommended to be used as surrogates. Um, if you look at smallmouth bass, it persists a lot longer. So this is not good news, right? Because the salmonids themselves are not, are not very robust. But these surrogates, if you, if you use this model to predict the outcome, you're going to be way, um, you're going to be really overly optimistic about how much you can actually reduce their fecundity, their reproductive output. And the cutthroat trout, remember that that's the same, the same genus as these salmonids. That's the worst of all. It's the most insulting, right? That actually you can, it'll persist up to like 28% reduction in fecundity and still the population is going, is increasing, right? So this was a little, a bit of an eye opener. Um, for up to 10%, it didn't really matter. Right? So if you've got some kind of toxin, pesticide, what have you, um, up to 10%, they all look the same. But beyond that, you start to run into trouble. Um, even at, at 15%, things go, go awry. And so even within the same genus, this idea of surrogate species is, is not, it's not okay, right? It's not helping us, all right? So we took this um, and tried to apply it then to biological control. Right? So we started thinking more about ecosystem services, and we chose um, some uh, parasitoid wasps, all uh, that are important in the control, mostly of uh, fruit flies, oriental fruit fly, Mediterranean fruit fly, which are economically very important in places in the U.S., like Hawaii, um, on, the, on the citrus crops in California as well. Right? There's a lot of, a lot of uh, attention and resources are applied to trying to control fruit flies in citrus crops. And, um, and D. rapey is a common um, uh, parasitoid on aphids, right? So again, very, very important. These, um, these flies are often found in the same areas, right? You've got different types of citrus, different types of crops in, in generally in the same areas. There's a, there's a whole rich literature now on area-wide control that's based on some of this um, some of the work that, um, some of the data that, that we got from Roger at the USDA. Um, and we were asking the question, wanted to, to ask the question, now that we had this, this sort of um, methodology in place, do we need to test the response of all these species, all these biocontrol agents um, separately, or can we just choose one and say, okay, that's good enough, right? And remember, taking a step back, the, the requirement in the US to look at the effects of a pesticide on any kind of insect is just how does the honeybee do, right? So this is, this is like miles beyond that, right? Saying, okay, let's look at all these different braconids. Do they, do they act differently? Obviously, they're much more closely related. Um, so what we did was, again, we had data from both the Vargas lab and the Stark lab, um, uh, and we could get data because um, they've got technicians that can, that can actually just get that life history data, right? So again, it's very intensive, but in about 30 days, you can get a nice array of data and then get these values that we need for the matrix, survivorships, and fecundity, right? So again, we did this four-stage model, and we asked the question, where does the, the population threshold lie? And if you look at these four different parasitoid braconid wasps, it's, it's a, a very different situation between P. fletcheri and D. rapey, right? So if you were to look at any one, so it's a surrogate species um, approach again, right? If you were to look at D. rapey and say, okay, it can handle a 64% reduction in fecundity before it actually goes to extinction, um, that's good enough for us, right? 
if you make that assumption, you're gonna be um, woefully misled because P, um, P. Fletcheri, for instance, it's terribly susceptible, right? At 11%, it, it starts to go um, extinct. So we, um, and Fulpius erysanus um, is some, somewhere in the middle, right? So again, not an appropriate surrogate. So you can't use these interchangeably, is the bottom line, even though they're all Braconids. So um, we've got another app, um, Mac Windows <laughs> mismatch here. There's supposed to be ADAs here, um, which looks like this. So just imagine there's an ADA here, minus ADA1, minus ADA2, and so on. Somehow they disappeared on the walk over here. So um, we did the same thing we did with the fecundity, but with all the survivorship now, right? So we're adding that in as well. Um, and then this R0 with the toxin, this expression now becomes much uglier, and much more unyieldy, but this is it. Um, and then we were able to play the same game and look at what happens when we reduce the fecundity, which is this delta here on this axis, and what happens when we reduce survivorship. And so we made these, and I'm sorry, it's a little washed out here, but this, this grid I placed at one, which means that's where the threshold is. And if you look out here, if, you've got, if you're not subtracting anything off for survivorship or for fecundity, this is peaking up above. This is kind of a wave in the front here. The angle is a little bit tricky. Um, but then as you go down this axis and reduce survivorship, at one point it, it actually goes below the threshold. And the same for this side. It's actually much more um, robust in terms of re reproductive output reductions. So if you reduce, it, it, it does better there. So we can get this surface curve here to take a look at what is actually happening when we're, when we're reducing both fecundity and survivorship. Um, and I'll, I'll break this down in a minute. I just want to give you the overview and then we'll, we'll start to look a little bit more in detail at these. Um, this, by the way, that was the rapey. That was the fly that did really well. Sorry, the fly, the wasp that did really well. Um, and this is P. fletcheri. This is the Braconid that did the worst. And you can see it barely is surviving um, at all, even when there's no reduction at zero, zero, but then as, as you move away in either direction, it, it blinks out, all right? So it's, it's quite weak in terms of its response to these things. All right, um, what I'm doing here now, so I'm gonna ask you to think about um, just looking at one side of, of this and flipping it around. So this is reduction in survivorship. So it's, it's, it's the left side of this graph, and I'm doing a cross section. Just the left side, looking at, at um, so spin that around in your head, so then it's, it's actually flipped around this way. But this is proportional reduction in survivorship, that eta, and this is the R0, right, with the toxin. Okay, and these are the four species. And the one that does best, as we saw before, was D. rapey, right? So that's this one up here. That's D. rapey. And then the one that does worst is P. fletcheri. When I, by best and worst, I'm not trying to be too judgmental. I'm just saying this is more robust, right? The D. rapey. With, with, at, at the same proportional reduction in survivorship, it's, it's R0. It's reproductive. Population growth is much higher, right? So it's not, it's not getting hit as hard, right? So that's, and then these other two species, Long Longicondata and, um, and F. Um, Arisanus, which um, remind me to, to tell you a little bit about that at the end, because we're starting to work with, with that in, uh, in another project in the field. These are very similar, right? With these reductions, they're almost interchangeable, right? So these would actually be good surrogates for each other, but not for these other, these other species. Um, so that was very interesting, but it doesn't say much about mechanism, right? And you always want to get to the mechanism. So the idea that we had next was, why don't we look at and see if there's something special about how these different braconids, um, how their population growth is affected by the parameters that we're using to generate these population estimates. And the parameters are the A's, right, the survivorships and the fecundities. And we can do what's called a sensitivity or an elasticity analysis. You probably are familiar with that. And the idea here would be to see, you know, which, for, for these population outcomes, um, how sensitive are they to changes in each of those A's and F's that are in the model, all right? And to do that, all you need to do is use calculus and take the derivative of this expression here with respect in turn to A1, A2, A3, and A4, for instance. All right, so that's just a partial derivative. And you can actually do this by hand with pencil and paper, old fashioned, right? You just write it down. 
um, which I did, and then I made a few mistakes, and I had to redo it, and then I did it again. But it's actually a very slick way of looking at a nice, um, uh, 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 looking at the dependence of the population outcome on these, on these um, parameters, right? And these are ugly, but then we can actually plot them. And so here's the, here's the first thing I'd like you to, to notice. This is that population outcome graph that I just showed you before. And these are the two species that are very similar. And this is what their sensitivity profiles look like. If you look, this is proportion of reduction in survivorship, and this is the partial derivative. This is the derivative with respect to the different A's. And so the A's are plotted here, A1, A2, A3, A4. These are the partial derivatives. And you can just look at it from afar and see they're very similar. They look very similar. The dependence of the population outcome is very similar for both of these on all four of the, the survivorship um, parameters. If you look at the two species that are really different though, D. rapi and P. fletcheri, the sensitivity analysis is very different looking. Right, so, so there's something about, there's in, for instance, in this case, um, A4 is much more important for d rapi. Um, the, the population outcome is more sensitive to A4 uh, than A3 um, after, after a reduction of, of 1.75. Um, and then over here, it's the opposite. A3 is more important than A4. So the dependence on the population outcomes on, on these different life history parameters is very different for the, for the species that act very different in the end, right? So there's a clue here that there's something about the underlying life history parameters that is driving these differences in the population responses. Um, so shifting gears, what we've been doing recently is looking at resistance and evolution of resistance to pesticides because we've started to, to think about these models in terms of, well, you know, there's different susceptibilities and that changes over time. So if you look at multiple generations, what happens when they develop resistance? Does that change how these things um, predict each other's fate, right? So the surrogate species outcomes change if one species is more susceptible than another. So we hadn't incorporated that, right? All this, all this stuff was without any kind of evolutionary response, and that's a little bit unrealistic, um, especially with these hymenoptera in the field. So we started to do some theoretical um, analyses of this stuff, and I'm not gonna go into this, but basically the right-hand column here is, is susceptibility, or resistance, I should say, to the pesticide, and the left-hand column is the, the two different species that we were looking at earlier, the D. rapi and the, the um, oh, sorry, D. longicondata, two of those species that we looked at before. And their species response um, can be very different or it can be very similar depending on, uh, in, this, in this column, how susceptible they are to, to pesticides over time, right? So we can, we can play around with this theory. What we're trying to do next is empirically derive some of these things. So we're trying to, to write a grant right now that'll let us actually do this stuff in the lab and corroborate the results of this, this stuff here. So um, to wrap up here, hey, good timing. Um, the, the population models approach that we, we've developed here, I think um, have sort of, we've been able to show that the surrogate species approach is really misleading in many cases. Um, the, salmon, uh, the salmon are poorly protected by the steelhead trout for instance, even though they're in the same genus, the D. rapi response uh, is very different from the P. fletcheri, and so you can't use those as interchangeable surrogates for each other. Um, the sensitivity analysis is really a key to understanding what the underlying mechanism might be. Um, I'm hoping that we could develop even an index someday that would show us a ratio of the different uh, survivorship parameters or something that would actually be kind of the, it would be the golden bullet that would actually let us just definitively show that these are gonna be good surrogates or these are not. That may be too much to wish for, but we're still trying to figure that out. Um, uh, but the approach can help us think about tailoring pesticides to reduce the impact on certain life stages, right, by using these stage or, or age structured models. Uh, and then finally, we're, we're playing around with the evolution of, of resistance uh, and life history trade-offs. I'm not gonna talk about it here, but I thought I'd mention, um, because this is the, a common point that Nacho and I have, um, we're doing some work with folks up in SLU in Uppsala the last several years looking at bumblebees. The model is much more, <laughs> much more complicated, um, but we have been trying to do a similar approach with these different, a couple differential equations 
uh, looking at sensitivity analyses to try to figure out um, similar you know, responses to pesticides in bumblebee populations. Obviously, it's much more complicated because you have these different life stages and different, um, a, a very different life history, but I'm glad to talk to folks about that. And these are some of the references I, I was dropping as we were talking, and with that, I will answer any questions you might have. <laughs>